Jesus gave his life a ransom yonder on Calvary. On Mount Calvary, cruel Calvary, paved the way by blood that we might win a bright shining crown. Praise his holy name. name. Salvation has been brought down. No glory. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Salvation has been brought down. Go and, go and show and shout and shout and tell it the world around. Preach it and tell it today. People in sorrow, tell it today. Tell it tomorrow. Preach the word of God that we might win a shining crown. Heaven, tell the lost. All the lost. Salvation is full and free. To sinners, spread the news. The Blessed news. news all over the land and sea. Go preach it and tell it afar in every nation. Tell it afar all over creation. Praise the Lord. The Lord. Blessed Lord. Salvation has been brought down. All alone without a friend he suffered to pay it all. Yes, he paid it all. Jesus paid it all. In his blessed promises sweet victory can be found. Praise his holy name. name. Salvation has been brought down. No oh, glory. Praise, Praise the Lord. The Lord. Lord. Salvation has been, been brought down. down. Go, and go and show and shout and shout and tell it the world around. Go preach it and tell it today. To people in sorrow, tell, tell it today. today. Tell it tomorrow. Preach, preach the word of God that we might win a shining crown. Heaven, tell, tell the lost. The lost. All the lost. Salvation is full and free. To sinners spread the news. The news. Blessed news all over the land and sea. Go preach it and tell, tell it afar in every nation. Tell it afar all over creation. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Blessed Lord. Salvation has been brought down. There's a blessed home prepared way over in glory land. In bright glory land. Blessed glory land. I have trusted in his love and now I am heaven bound. Praise his holy name. name. Salvation has been brought down. No oh, glory. Praise, Praise the Lord. The Lord. Salvation has been brought down. Go, go and show and shout and shout and, shout and tell it the world around. Go preach it and tell it today. To people in sorrow, tell, tell it today. today. Tell it tomorrow. Preach the word of God that we might win a shining crown. Heaven tell the Lord. All, all, all salvation is full and free. To sinners spread the news. The news. Blessed news all over the land and sea. Go preach it and tell, tell it afar in every nation. Tell it afar all over creation. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Blessed Lord. Salvation has been brought down. And I really believe we'll come together to get a blessing from that word. We're still staying at the cross. Because you know, if it's ever proper to say that any one place is more especially holy and sacred than any other. It has to be the place of the cross. When you come to the uh, chapters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, for that matter, that speak of the crucifixion of Jesus, if you come in the right attitude, you feel rather like Moses. And there in the wilderness, he saw the bush that burned but was not consumed. And he heard the voice that said, Put off your shoes from off your feet. The ground on which you stand is holy. Well, that's how I feel when I, I come to John chapter 19. We looked at John chapter 18 early this week. John chapter 19 is where John describes the suffering and the agony of Jesus in the most beautiful terms, the most touching terms. But it seems to me that if there's a climax in that chapter, it has to be verse 30, where we hear Jesus say, It is finished. They, as I'm sure you know, were the last words spoken by Jesus on the cross. In actual fact, he didn't say, It is finished. He cried with a loud voice, It is finished. In fact, it takes three words in English, It is finished. In actual fact, the word Jesus used was, one word, Tetelestai. It is accomplished. It has been done. It's finished. Not a, not a cry of sorrow, not a, not a whimper of a man uh, eating out the last ounces of energy, but a, a cry of victory. And we'll, we'll say more of that in a moment or two. 
Uh, you've heard sermons, I'm sure, on that text, It is Finished. And sometimes, uh, friends like to talk about the finished work of Christ. Well, it all depends on what you mean by the finished work of Christ. Because I want to suggest to you that if you're thinking solely in terms of the acquisition of redemption, the application of redemption, this is not the text you need. It was never used in that way. It was used of much more than simply the acquisition of redemption, the fulfillment of God's plan of redemption. I know that sometimes it has been said there is nothing to do, it has all been done. Well, that, it seems to me, is an unfortunate statement to make because you can't support that from the Word of God. However, think about this for just a minute. It is finished. What does it mean? Well, as I say, it's the last of the seven words on the cross. It's rather interesting to notice that Jesus is always concerned with individuals at the very beginning. For example, the first word on the cross was directed, perhaps contrary to what many people think, uh, not to the people in general, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was directed to the Roman soldiers who had just been responsible for nailing him to the cross. He certainly didn't say that with respect to his enemies, because they knew very well what they were doing. After all, they quite deliberately, as I told you last night, they quite deliberately sub submitted Jesus to a death upon which they knew the curse of God rested, in order to humiliate him. And they framed him between two thieves as another evidence of their contempt for him. They knew what they were doing. Jesus is thinking of these Roman soldiers. He's wanting to tie up the loose ends, so to speak. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They were pagan Romans. They didn't understand it. They were the tools of imperial Rome at that time. Again, the second word of the cross, directed to the penitent thief, you remember, the man who'd seen Jesus in his agony and warned across and changed his attitude, uh, as you read in, in, in the Gospel according to Luke. And gradually as the hours dragged by, he said, This man has done nothing wrong. And then said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus met the longing of that man's heart when he said, Today, this day, you shall be with me in paradise. The third word on the cross was directed to Mary and to John. It's interesting, you know, that even then, during all the agony of crucifixion, with the nails eating into his flesh, and the blood streaming down his torn, pierced brow onto his face, Jesus could forget that and concentrate on the agony that he knew Mary was enduring, the suffering to which she was passing, and the loneliness of the experience. When he looked at her and said tenderly, Woman, behold your son. Now don't be put off by the word woman, because that was the, the word that is used there is a word that is used by servants in addressing their queen. You know, it means lady, it means majesty. It's not just the term of woman, it's woman. It's a beautiful term as it comes from the lips of Jesus. A word full of tenderness and compassion and love. Woman, behold your son. And to John's son, Behold your mother. He's concerned that Mary should not be lonely. He permits Mary to the care of John. And John, who rightly tells us that afterwards he took Mary to his own home. So, to begin with, he's concerned with individuals. Then he begins to think about himself. He begins to think about himself in terms of fulfilling scripture. That the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. But I'll talk about that in just a moment or two. The point I want to make is that even on the cross, the Lord is concerned about what are comparatively little things. He's concerned about the feelings of other people. All those little things are neatly tied up, and he leaves no loose ends. Only then does he think about himself. Finally, he cries, it has been accomplished. Because he knew that he had attended to everything necessary. He fulfilled the will of the Father, and redemption was not possible. And it was then that with a cry of triumph, he dismissed his spirit. It's not that Jesus simply curled up and died. It's not that, as I said before, that the energy was gradually drained out of him. 
It was like an oil lamp that was running dry and finally spluttered and went out. He didn't run out. I mean, in fact, not long ago, that uh, Jesus murmured, it is finished. Nonsense, my friends. Jesus murmured nothing of the kind. He shouted. He cried with a loud voice. It was a cry of exultation. It was a cry of triumph. You know, there's even an element of joy in that cry. It has been accomplished. It's all been done. That's not the wine of a victim. It's the cry of a victor. Of course, you can't talk about a victory unless you talk about a conflict. And surely there had been a conflict. That conflict is hinted at way back in the book of Genesis. Genesis 3 and verse 15, where passing sentence and all those involved in the first sin, God had gave him that wonderful redemptive promise. He laid the seed of redemptive truth when he said, The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head, for he shall bruise his heel. And there was a conflict. There was a titanic and earth shattering conflict. And it's a conflict that's very important to us, because it's the conflict that issued ultimately in our salvation. And Jesus refers to that in Matthew chapter 12, where in verses 28 and 29, he uses that little illustration of the strong man, and he says, no man can uh, take a strong man's goods or go into the strong man's house until he first binds the strong man. And he's talking about Satan. In that illustration, the strong man is Satan. The strong man's house is the world. The strong man's possessions are the souls of men. And Jesus is talking about gaining the victory over the strong man. In fact, in John chapter 12, verse 31, you see that conflict being worked out because Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Stop going along now, Jesus says, before Satan's defeated. I'm going to inflict defeat upon him. I'm going to set the prisoners free. So, Genesis 3, the conflict foretold. Matthew 12, the conflict joined. John 19, the conflict won when Jesus said, it has been accomplished. Now, Hebrews 2 and verse 14 hints at that too. The writer is talking about that conflict between Jesus and Satan. He says that Jesus died, that in dying he might destroy the one who had the power of death, even the devil, and set free all those people who throughout their lifetime had been subject to the bondage of the fear of death. So there you've got the, the enemy identified, the one who has the power of death, and you've got the one who's going to gain the victory. By dying, Jesus says that by dying, he will defeat Satan and set the prisoners free. Now if that tells me anything, my dear friends, tonight, it tells me this. That what Jesus did, he did for every one of us. When we got to face the problems and the failures and the defeats and the sins of our lives, it's good for us to go back to the cross to hear Jesus say in triumph, it has been accomplished. Because what he says is, what I did, I did for you. I gained your victory. I defeated your enemy. I broke Satan's hold over you. And the first thing you should recognize is that by his death on the cross, Jesus has wiped away the guilt of your past sins if you trust in him. Now notice, he took our guilt, our sins, all the way to the cross. More than that, he bore our sins into the wilderness. Well, that's a marvelous thought. You go back to Leviticus chapter 16, that talks about the day of atonement. In that passage, by the way, the day of atonement was pretty close to the time of the Passover, when all this was happening at Calvary. In that passage, you discover there that two lambs were chosen. Don't be, be confused by the word scapegoat, because the word for a young goat was his lamb anyway in the Hebrew. A lamb can be either a young sheep or a young goat. It doesn't make any difference. Two lambs were chosen. One was to be the lamb for the atonement for the sins of the nation. The high priest sacrificed that lamb. Upon the head of the other lamb, called Azazel, scapegoat, he placed his hands, transmitting the sins of the nation to the head of the lamb. 
the Bob was sent out into the wilderness, never to be seen again, never to be heard of again, bearing away the sins of the people. Now, you know that passage in John chapter 1, verse 29, everybody knows it. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist wasn't thinking about crucifixion. John the Baptist did not think of the cross. He didn't know the way that God was going to go, or how God was going to act. John the Baptist was thinking of the snake goat. Behold the Lamb of God who carries away the sin of the world. John could see sins, the sins of the world, being carried away by the scapegoat into the wilderness. And that's what Paul talks about. He says, Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. Just as the lamb was provided by God to carry away the sins into the wilderness, so the prophet Isaiah says in a lovely passage, Isaiah chapter 53, The Lord has laid upon him our scapegoats, the iniquity of us all. That's why he's called the Lamb of God. You remember that Abraham, way back in Genesis 22, had prophetically spoken about that Lamb. When he'd been called upon to offer Isaac as a sacrifice there on Mount Moriah, and had been wonderfully spared at the very last moment, Abraham had said prophetically, God will himself provide the Lamb for the sacrifice. I don't think Abraham knew the one what he was saying then. He was speaking prophetically. But it came through. And God did provide the lamb. And all our sins were laid on Jesus. Now here is something for you to take hold of tonight. If all of your sins were laid on Jesus, they're all gone. Believe that. Listen. The same that says, payment by God will not demand, first at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. You see what David is saying? He's saying, God's not going to want double payment. Payment by God will not demand, first at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. It's a grand thing. God's not going to demand payment for your sin from you when Jesus bore your sin in his own body on that tree. And as Christians, I believe, we need constantly to remind us of that truth. Sometimes we struggle along with a burden that God never meant us to bear. One of the passages in the Old Testament says that God has cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Now let something do that. He's put them aside. No fishing. So don't go fishing where God says, all your sins of the depths of the sea. Leave them alone. You don't want them back. And if you're not a Christian, I'll tell you something tonight. There's no way of getting rid of your sin until you come to the blood of Christ. And if you come to the blood of Christ, there's no way you can hold on to your sin. That's the truth. But, of course, we need to know more than that our past sins have been taken away. We need to know that the grip of sin on our lives has been broken. Uh, and Jesus didn't only die to forgive us, but he died to give us a victory in our daily lives. Over all those things that are ungodly, that means not like God, the things that are unchristlike, and to give us a guaranteed future. That's the marvelous Calvary. It doesn't only deal with your past, it deals with a victorious present, and it deals with a triumphant future. Past present and future are dealt with on the cross. I don't think so, this is it. But don't you know that Jesus died to help you to overcome those things in your life that you can't overcome with yourself? Lovelessness, enmity, unkindness, impurity, jealousy. You'll never overcome those failings in your own strength. You have to take them to the cross and be reminded that when Jesus gained the victory on the cross, he did so that you might be victorious in your daily life. Romans chapter 6 is a marvelous passage. It says that when you're united with Christ in your baptism, when you're buried with him, you rise with him to walk in a new life, that sin may no longer have dominion over you. Now that means that when you're baptized into the death of Jesus, you're not the devil's man any longer. 
You don't serve me. He has not a hold over you. He has no claim on you. You're Jesus, man. You're Jesus, woman. You belong to him. And it means that because you're a Christian, you're going to have the power to break the hold of sin in your life. If you want. I'm not telling you that that means that sin's no longer possible. I'm not telling you that it means there's never going to be a temptation or that you're never going to want to yield to temptation. But I'll tell you what it does mean. It means that the struggle's not as hopeless as it once was. There's a power for victory that Jesus has demonstrated that sin can be overcome and because of him we share the victory of his cross. How? By his spirit that dwells in us. That's the wonderful thing of the day of Pentecost. Peter didn't simply say repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. There's a double blessing there. Peter said, and you shall receive the gift, the dorea, the free gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know what the Holy Spirit is supposed to be doing in your life, he is there as God's gift to you to help you overcome the problems and the difficulties and the sins and the temptations of your life. That's the way to victory, through his Spirit dwelling in a, in a, in a man. The bondage of sin is ended. That's what it means. When Jesus said, it is finished, salvation has been made possible. God's plan of redemption has been made effective. But there's a second thing that is involved in this uh, statement of Jesus, it is finished. Jesus meant that the old law was ended, that the new covenant was ratified by the shedding of his blood. You remember, in the sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, Not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. And it's the same word, until all is accomplished. He said again, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. It's the same word, accomplish. To bring it to completion. And that's what Jesus did. When Jesus died on the cross, the demands of the law were met. The law was nailed to that cross. He has taken away the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, nailing it to his cross as a, as a, as a cancelled debt. That's what it means. Remember Matthew 27, what happened when Jesus died? They of the temple went in two from top to bottom. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a boy, I, I had the idea that that somehow, that somehow had to do with the dome of the temple. You know, I, I, I really did. I, I, I felt that in some way, it was always a little bolt of lightning struck the dome of the temple, and the dome of the temple was, was split from top to bottom. Anybody else have that idea? Maybe yes, I can see from one or two of you anyway, about the same misconception. But it doesn't mean that at all, does it? Hey? It doesn't mean that at all. It's talking about the beautiful veil in the temple that separated the holy place where the ordinary priest ministered from the holy of holies in which only the high priest might go on the one day of the year, twice on the one day, first to offer his own sins and the sins of his family and the sins of the nation. Now, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 8 says the way into the sanctuary was not yet opened. And that's absolutely true. As long as that veil was in place, men did not have free access into the presence of God. But when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was miraculously torn, done away with, rendered ineffective. It no longer concealed anything. It hid nothing any longer. And from top to bottom, you know, it's now, I don't see any curtains in this place, but if you go home and want to tear your curtain, you won't start at the top, will you, on the curtain rail, or where the hooks are. You'll, you'll naturally start at the bottom. That's the way men do things, isn't it? You'll start at the bottom and tear upwards. But the veil, the beautiful veil of scarlet and blue and gold and, and a fine, fine linen, was not torn from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. This was a divine action. God did this. And that signified the way into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God, was open for all men. 
I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I sometimes stop to think, what, what an impact that must have had upon the priest ministering in the temple at that time. Remember, the fight up to the time that Jesus died, and beyond for that matter, from the lady 70, they were serving in the temple. The priests were going about their daily business of the incense and attending to sacrifices. Can you imagine? A group of priests in the holy place where they were ministering. Quite suddenly, the veil of the temple is virtually discarded, and they find themselves looking into the very holy of holies, symbolic of the very presence of God, where under normal circumstances the Ark of the Covenant would be situated, with the mercy seat, the golden mercy seat, and the cherubim with wings arched above the mercy seat where only the high priest himself, in trepidation and fear, appeared before God on that day of atonement? You know how holy, how fearful, how awful that place was? When the high priest himself went in, with the golden bells and the pomegranates hemming his garment, with the people might hear him moving about inside, and be sure that he was alive? Do you know that at one period in, in Jewish history, they actually tied a rope around the waist of the high priest, so that if he went in there and he died before God, they could drag out his body without anybody having to go in? That's how terrible it was. Imagine the terror of the ordinary priest in Jerusalem that day, when the veil of the temple simply was torn aside, and they looked into where the Ark of the Covenant was. As should have been. As they should have been, because in AD 96, when Pompey recklessly went into the Holy of Holies, Pompey, the Roman general, he found nothing. The Ark of the Covenant, in all probability, despite what we heard about the raiders of the lost Ark and all that kind of stuff, the Ark of the Covenant is in all probability destroyed in Babylonian captivity and never actually rebuilt again, because Jeremiah would say, there will come a time when they will ask no more for the Ark of the Covenant. And will not be made again. In all probability, although the high priest went through the motions inside the holy holies in the days of Jesus, nevertheless, they still regarded the holy of holies as symbolic of heaven and the very presence of God. And I say again, terror? Yes, there was terror that day. Boldness? Ah, we have boldness to enter. That's what Hebrews 10 and 20 says. Hebrews 10 and 20 says, We now have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. By the way, that new and living way, that's an interesting word. You Bible scholars, look it up in your Greek lexicon, and you'll find it's the Greek word prospathos, and it means a newly slain way or a bloodstained way. We have all this to enter in by a newly slain, bloodstained way, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So the death of Jesus means that his flesh was torn. Not a bone in his body was broken, you know. That may not happen. But his flesh was torn, his blood was shed, and by that bloodstained way, it is now possible for you and for me to approach into the very presence of God with boldness, because Jesus has accomplished that. And in Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15, He is our peace, who has broken down the middle wall, having abolished in his flesh the enemy, even the law of commandment. Jesus has abolished in his flesh the law of commandments. Romans 10 and 4 says, He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So Jesus said, It is finished. He that's the old law was done with. And the new covenant was ratified, whereby we can become sons and daughters of God. The third thought here, too, when Jesus said, It is finished. He meant that he had completed his obedience and his submission to the will of the Father. Now you remember that all through his life, this was something Jesus had been concerned about. 
He said he came not to do his own will, but the will that he was sent. Uh, for example, in John chapter 4, uh, verse 34, there's that story of the woman of the well. The woman who came out from the village in Samaria at midday. Now, she came alone, and Jesus struck up a conversation with her, and finally sent her back to the village, telling the people, Come, say a man who told me all that ever I did is not this the Christ. And his disciples came back. They'd been buying food in the Samaritan village. They offered him food, and Jesus said, I have food you don't know about. And his wife, somebody gave him something to eat. And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. But all through his life, that's what he said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I do always the things that are well pleasing unto my father. And first, that culminated there in that scene in the garden, where Jesus there in the darkness poured out his heart in prayer to the Father, saying the same words three times, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was ahead of him. Jesus wasn't insensitive to pain. Indeed, I suppose Jesus was more sensitive to pain than you and I simply because his body was not coarsened by sin. He was more sensitive to the evil around him because of his own purity and righteousness. And he naturally, as a man, shrank from the agony that a new crucifixion would bring upon him. That's why he said three times, sweating out into a great drops of blood falling to the ground. The word says, if it is possible, let this cup. He already referred to it, a cup of suffering, hadn't he? Pass from me. Then you see, the word of triumph, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now that is where Jesus laid himself down by the will of the Father. That's when his will became, his submission to the will of God became complete. Total obedience to God. And in a sense, you know, it was in Gethsemane that the victory was won. The formality took place on the cross. The victory was won when Jesus accepted the burden in Gethsemane. The historic event took place at Calvary. So when Jesus said, it is finished, there on the cross he knew that he submitted himself perfectly to the will of the Father. And then, I would suggest to you yet again, that when Jesus said, it is finished, it is accomplished, it is fulfilled, he meant that the prophetic word had been fulfilled. In fact, if you look at John 19, verse 28, it says, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, said that the scriptures might be fulfilled, I thirst. Now notice that. He says that the scriptures might be fulfilled, I thirst. Now, if you want that passage, you go back to Psalm 69. And verse 21, where it says, They gave me vinegar mingled with gall to drink. And that's exactly what they did when Jesus was on the cross. So, it is finished. Really meant that the prophetic scriptures were fulfilled. Now, it's my belief that the next word on the cross has to do with that. Jesus then said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, many views have been expressed about the significance of that text, but I believe it's also significant to notice that Jesus spoke in Aramaic. He quoted that passage as a Jewish rabbi would quote it, when he was meditating on the word of God. He didn't say it in Greek, as he said in so, on so many occasions. For example, there at Nazareth, when he returned to the place where he was brought up, and he quotes from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because you have anointed me to preach that to you know the passage, don't you? Now that, Jesus quoted that in Greek. But for once in his life, there on the cross, suffering as he was suffering, Jesus quoted an Old Testament prophecy in Aramaic, in the dialect of the Hebrews, Eloi, Eloi Lama Sabachthani. That's what he said. Now, I believe at that time Jesus was thinking of Psalm 22, with which those, with which, uh, the words with which that psalm begins. My God, my God, 
why hast thou forsaken me? Sometimes it's said that Jesus did not turn his face away from God, away from his son. I honestly can't believe that. God looks at me in my sin. God looks at you in your sin. God knew the kind of world he was sending his son into. And remember that Jesus died in full obedience to the Father. I believe that Jesus was doing what a rabbi did. That he was meditating. A rabbi would would, 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 would quote the first part of the passage of scripture aloud, and then he would run through the psalm silently in his own mind. And I think it's a wonderful thought that on the cross Jesus was quite deliberately taking Psalm 22 and recognizing that he was fulfilling it on the cross, that the scriptures were being fulfilled in his crucifixion. They parted my garments among them, and for my best they cast lots. They gave me vinegar mingled with gall to drink. All my bones are out of John. You know the passage, don't you? There's no doubt at all. Psalm 22 is one of the prime prophetic passages concerning the Messiah and his suffering. And not only his suffering. You read on in Psalm 22. It doesn't end on the cross. There's resurrection. I will declare thy name among my brethren in the midst of the congregation. He talks about being in the midst of the congregation. There's resurrection there, you see. So I believe that Jesus was a buying prophecy on that occasion. Every step of the way, he said that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When he was born, the manner of his birth, his upbringing as a boy, his teachings, his miracles, were all fulfillment of the prophetic word. That is why he could say, it is accomplished. All has been, has been fulfilled. Remember, to the two men on the road to Emmaus, even after his resurrection, beginning with Moses, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures of things concerning himself. You know, I, you know, I, 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 I love to hear good Bible exposition. I love to hear someone handling the word of God who knows the word. But to have been there that day, oh my, to have been there, to, been, to have been a third to that audience of two, and have heard the Son of God moving with, with facility and ease among the prophecies of the Old Testament, weaving them together, showing the pattern, expounding them, exposing them. Why, I think I would have given ten years of my life to have spent half an hour listening to him. Well, Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. It is finished. And then, one last thought here. And this is a more personal thing for Jesus. I believe that when Jesus said, it is finished, it is complete, he was also talking about his personal sufferings. Now, you know that he did suffer. I mentioned Isaiah 53. You have to go back to Isaiah 53, begin about verse 13, to read about the suffering servant of God. Behold, my servant, Isaiah 53 begins. Then it begins, you have to leave our report, and whom is the arm of the Lord and the dealer. They shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his wounds, his stripes, we are healed. Now there's the, the, the prophet speaking of the suffering Savior, and that suffering was his all through his life. The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man doesn't have where to lay his head. Finally, eh, knowing that people wanted to kill him, they, they took him and they spat upon him. They plucked the hairs out of his cheeks, causing him pain. They scourged him with the Roman scourge, a terrible weapon. They, they crowned him with that crown of thorns, six inches long, perhaps. They beat him with cross. And they said, prophesy to us. And finally, they led him out to Calvary, to the place of the skull, bearing his own cross 
until he fell to the ground beneath that gruesome load, exhausted. They had to take it and place it upon the shoulders of another, Simon of Cyrene, coming out of the country, in other words, arriving at the city, and they seized on Simon, a colored man he was, and they turned him around and put the load on his back, and they sent him back out to Calvary, carrying the cross for Jesus. Not out of consideration for your master, to your lord, but because the Roman soldiers were afraid that he might have died before they had the opportunity of carrying out the sentence. Then he died with blood streaming from head, hands, and feet. And Jesus now says, It is finished. It is over. The sufferings of Jesus as a man are gone. So let's sum this up. So far as God is concerned, Jesus could say, I have been obedient and submissive to the will of man. So far as the law is concerned, it is finished because it was nailed to his cross. So far as the prophecies were concerned, redemptive prophecy went into fulfillment at Calvary. So far as you and I are concerned, Satan has been defeated. Sin has been put away. The possibility for victory has been created. And so far as he is concerned, his suffering was ended, and he could return to the Father from whence he came. That's what it is finished means. But it's not all finished yet. It doesn't finish yet. In Mark chapter 16, verses 14 to 18, you find Jesus talking with his disciples, and he gives them the great commission, and they went everywhere preaching the word. Listen, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with the signs which followed. He's working. The preaching of the gospel's not finished. He's even working tonight on somebody's heart for all I know. He's still working. Whatever the gospel is preached in faithfulness, he, through his spirit, will work upon hearts of men and women to bring them to conviction concerning their need of salvation. Indeed, the book of Acts of Apostles might rightly be called the book of Acts of the risen Christ. Because you remember the book begins, the former treatise of our maid, O most excellent Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day that he was taken unto heaven. And the implication is that this is a continuation of the work of Jesus. He's still at work, he's not on earth, he's not a man, but he's still working, and he's working from heaven. Indeed, in Acts chapter 2, after Peter had preached the message for the first time, verse 47 says, The Lord added to them daily those who are being saved. Now, I believe that tonight, in some places of the world, souls will be added to the body of Christ. His kingdom will be extended. Make no mistake about this. You may join a denomination. You may join a church. But you cannot join the church of the Lord Jesus. You can be added to it. And he will add you to it in his own way. That's all. Then again, not only is he busy adding to his church, but he's busy interceding for his people. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, we're told that Jesus has gone into heaven there to appear before the face of God for us. I don't know what he's doing in heaven. I don't know altogether what he's doing. I've no idea of some things that he's doing, but I know one thing he's doing it for me. That's the important thing. He, for us, he's interceding. And when you feel weak, and when you're conscious of guilt in your life, you have the opportunity of using Jesus as your mediator. If any man sin, we have a, an advocate with the Father. Christ Jesus the righteous. And if we confess our sins, he is willing and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Oh yes, Jesus is still busy. He's our high priest. And by some folk today, don't think that Jesus is a king, but you remember that Zechariah actually says, he shall be, Zechariah chapter 6, he shall be a king, he shall be a priest upon his throne. And if you don't believe Jesus is on the throne, you don't believe he's a priest. But he's a priest upon his throne, and the government of peace is between them both. He's not a, a prince without power, sitting at the right hand of God, twiddling his thumbs, waiting for the time to come and he'll come back to earth to set up a kingdom. He has a kingdom. 
If you're a child of God tonight, you have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of the Son of God's love, in whom you have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that marvelous? John says that Jesus Christ, he says, I, John, your brother, in the patience and kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's a king, but he's a priest upon his throne. And he's interceding right now. And he'll continue to intercede. Look, every pain you experience as a child of God, every anxiety that you experience, he knows. Every suffering inflicted upon you, he feels. In Acts chapter 6, when Stephen was being stoned, Stephen said, I see Jesus standing. He says that Jesus could remain seated when a member of his body was being hurt. And when you're getting hurt as his child, he knows it. And he feels it. Because he loves you. And I'm putting out the time. There's an aspect of his work that is not even begun. He's going to come as judge. God hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. For of his given assurance to all men in that he's raised him from the dead. Acts 17, verse 34. Oh yes, Jesus will one day come back to be judged. And of course, how he judges you will be then depends upon our response to him now. He has accomplished what he came to do. But there's one crucial question that I have to ask you tonight. You've been very patient in listening to me. Has his purpose for your life been accomplished? Have you yielded in obedience to Jesus? Have you submitted to him? Have you made him the Lord of your life? Because, you know, wouldn't it be tragic if you had to think that Jesus endured all of that on the cross? did so much for you and yet it came to nothing because the amazing the stupendous truth is that you have it within your power to say no to him but even almighty God stands helpless before the citadel of your will and he can't force his way in and you need to yield to him I remind you of the text I'm going to be dealing with, perhaps on the Lord's Day Eve, God will. You've heard it before. You'll hear it many times. All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go make disciples of all nations. He follows baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the age. If you're present tonight, you really believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you want him to add you to his church, the church for which he came into the world, the church for which he died, you need to confess your faith in him, and you need to demonstrate your faith by yielding yourself in obedience to him in the ordinance he has commanded, the ordinance of baptism, that you might receive the forgiveness of sins, the indwelling presence of the Spirit in your life, and every blessing which is to be enjoyed in Christ Jesus. Reading how I love to proclaim it, reading by the blood of the Lamb, reading through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Reading, 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 reading by the blood of the Lamb, reading, 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 reading His child and forever I am. Reading then so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Reading, 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 reading by the blood of the Lamb. Reading, 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 his child and forever I am. 
I know I shall see in his beauty the King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, 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 redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, 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 his child and forever I am. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Tenderly Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come